All right, so I want to kind of recap uh, last week's lesson. I feel like we definitely got into the weeds, and by we, I mean me. Um, and I want to make sure that we're not lost in the fog of it all, because um, I'm sure that some of you guys are going, man, I came here to learn you know, principles on studying the Bible when you're talking all this nonsense. Um, <laughs> believe me, it's coming. Uh, we are uh, going to go over today, like I said, just this last part of the introduction, talk about some false principles of hermeneutics, and then we're going to get into, this is my optimism, of axioms of hermeneutics, axiomatic statements, all right, um, things that are self-evident. And then after that, in the following weeks is when we will be in the meat and potatoes of here are the rules of interpretation, okay? So we're just, we're, we're breezing through the introductory part. It's important to lay the foundation before we get into the, the other things. That's why we're doing it. All right, so Last week, we talked about the doctrine, the false doctrine of illumination. Essentially, what we need to make sure that we understand is the Holy Spirit does not divinely guide us to right interpretations. The Holy Spirit is active, and we will talk a little bit about this um, in this, in this finishing page three here this morning. But the Holy Spirit's main activity in, our interp- in, in, in Bible study is in the application when the Holy Spirit convicts us and moves us and helps us to see how does this apply to my life. But getting the actual meaning from the text comes from our ability to study or our ability to listen to a good teacher or preacher expound upon the Word. The Holy Spirit does not divinely guide us into divine interpretations. He does give us wisdom if we ask. And He does do some other things, like I said, which I'll, I'll mention here in a few minutes. So let's, let's get through this page three. Uh, The assumptions are hermeneutics. Number one, the divine origin of the Bible. These are things that we assume. We're not not debating these things. We don't talk about these things. We just assume them because they're they're topics that, for other classes, the divine origin of the Bible, it comes from God. Number two, the legitimacy of the canon. C-A-N-O-N. That means the 66 books, the 66 letters that we put together and, and, and put in nice binding and call it the Holy Bible, we assume that those are the right 66 books. And you guys remember uh, a year or so ago I taught a class here on questions about the canon, and we kind of went over why these books and not others. That was for the men. A few men will remember that, <laughs> as my wife reminded me. I know. I wanted to. Well, that's okay. We, we, can, we can teach it again. It's on YouTube, by the way, if you have any uh, desire. Um <laughs> So we, we assume that we have the right books. Number three, we uh, assume the text has reliability. The text has reliability. And then kind of coupled with that, number four, we see no need for higher criticism. That is, we assume the text that we have today is the same text that was originally penned. So when you read the book of Galatians, you're not questioning when it comes to hermeneutics. Well, I wonder if this variant is supposed to be there. I wonder if these are actually the words of Paul, if they've been changed. That's for another topic. Okay, so we assume when we come to the Scriptures, this is exactly the words that God wanted me to have. The limitations of hermeneutics. We've touched on this, so we won't spend a lot of time here. A particular interpretation is ever subject to revision in light of better method or added information. A particular interpretation is ever subject to revision in the light of better methods or added information. So if, you know, archaeological finds bring us something to tell us something about a city or, you know, whatnot, then it helps us to better understand what's going on. For example, if we were to excavate the city of Ephesus and we learned something about the goddess Artemis that we didn't know before, then we might be able to better understand what Paul was dealing with with the pagan culture there as he preached and taught and destroyed their idol worship. Number Two, an interpretation is just that. It is never the Word of God itself. This is so important, and this is really kind of hard to to draw a fast line on because you go, well, that's exactly what the Bible says. But remember we said anytime you begin to even define a word, it says Jesus is God. As soon as you define what you mean by God, or you go is as a verb, or you say Jesus, here's who he is, that's still interpretation. All right? Um, and the question was asked, well, then how can we be sure of any interpretation then? And I said, well, that's when we go to degrees of certainty, when we, when we make sure that we're practicing the good techniques, which we will go over. But I wanted to point out here on a tangent 
that, um, you know, there, there's a big debate in the uh, apologetic realm, and there's a lot of evangelical Christians that are going um, and accepting uh, that the earth is billions of years old. You know, they're accepting that, that scientific, quote, conclusion, uh, and they're then beginning to uh, base interpretations of Scripture off of that. They're, you know, they're, they're saying, hey, you know, a particular interpretation that the earth was created in six 24-hour days. Now we have better information through modern science, so we're going to reinterpret that. The Bible doesn't necessarily nail that down specifically, so they reinterpret the word day, reinterpret some of the um, meanings in Genesis 1 and 2, and, you know, they create these new uh, teachings. Ken Ham... Uh, from Australia, Answers in Genesis is his website, very famous, very influential, hardcore, six-day, 24 hours, um, creationist, okay? I like his stuff. I, I agree with the conclusion that, that the world was created in six 24-hour days, but here's where I think his methodology is wrong, and I've read his a lot of his books and his articles, and I've seen him debate people who believe in... Um, you know, old earth creationism and uh, who don't believe in creationism and things like that. Here's where he goes wrong. He will basically present this, you know, six, let's call it young earth creation because that's what it's called, okay, young earth creationism. He will present that as, well, that's what the Bible says. So if you don't believe that, you just don't believe the Bible. You're just believing other things. And so what ends up happening is he talks at people who are old earth creationists. Somebody who says, well, I believe the earth is billions of years old, and I believe the Bible, you know, will, will be okay with that, will support that. It doesn't necessarily take a definitive position on the age of the earth. And he'll say, well, the Bible says six days, so therefore, you know, that's, that's exactly what, you know, the Bible says. You don't believe the Bible. Therefore, you don't believe in Jesus. And, you know, you kind of, you just misinterpret everything. And what I, what I see happening there is frustration, because then people who are, you know, old earth creationists are frustrated because they say, it's not that I don't believe the Bible, and, it, and it's true. It's true. I've, I've met these people. I've talked to these people. I've had lunch with them. You know, I've had Bible discussions with them. I've gone on uh, trips with them. They do believe the Bible. They believe it as wholeheartedly as you do. They hold it as in high regard as you do. They believe in Jesus and love him just as much as you do. It's just a matter of interpretation. It's not a matter do they believe the Bible is the word of God or not. It's just a matter of interpretation. There's, there's a difference between debating somebody like that and debating somebody who's, you know, might say, well, you know, Genesis wasn't written by Moses and, you know, I don't even know if Jesus was really God or not. I mean, there's, that's two separate, you know, sort of things. So it's important, this is where it comes into play, it's important that when you have a view, whether it be on how old the earth is, whether, you know, you have a view on baptism, whether you have a view on, you know, the millennial, you know, dispensation, that it is your interpretation and you don't then picture people who disagree with you as you don't believe the Bible and criticize them in that sort of facet, all right? Because it might come to the point as, whole, you know, as wholeheartedly and as dearly as you hold your position that you could be wrong. So then when you find out you are wrong, then what? Now is it me who doesn't believe the Bible? You see what I'm saying? So it's, it's important that we remember interpretation is just that. It's never the word of God itself. All right. <clears throat> Qualifications of an interpreter, and we've gone over these. So, again, I just want to list them here um, for you. Spiritual, a passion to know the word of God, a passion to know the word of God. A lazy interpreter is a bad interpreter. Why is a lazy interpreter a bad interpreter? take the easiest route that they don't have to study about it. Exactly. They, here's something that I've found, and everybody does this to a degree. You don't understand a passage, right? I mean, Galatians 2, for me, was like one of the hardest passages to understand. Romans 9 through 11, you know, anything in Revelation. <laughs> right? <laughs> except the end. Yeah, except for the end, right? It, it's hard to understand, and you go, man, like I just, I just, it doesn't fit. You know, I read, I read these other parts of the scripture, and I, I see the flow, but here I just, I got, I got nothing, right? And then you read something or hear a lesson, and and somebody presents, oh, here's what it means, and it seems to make sense. And what do you do? Oh, good, I'm just gonna believe that. Because before in confusion, now that seems clear, so I'm just gonna believe that. I'm not gonna test it. 
I'm not going to critique it. Why? That, that takes work, right? I don't want to have to go back and look up the words and read other interpreters or read people who have heard that view and critique it or refute it. I don't want to have to do all that. That just seems pretty clear. I'm just going to accept that. It's a lazy interpreter. We don't want to be like that. Um, a passion to know the Word of God. We, we want to know the Word of God, this is important, for transfer, transformation, not information. We want to know the Word of God for transformation, not information. The Bible and Bible study is unlike any other study of mankind. You study, you know, rocket science so you can shoot rockets off into space and make money. You study, you know, how to perfect a baseball swing. Why? So you can teach a kid or, you know, be better at baseball yourself. You study the Bible to transform your character and to know God. You don't study it for information, just to be able to regurgitate it or be able to teach it or just be able to know it because you can be smarter than other people. I mean, I've met people who literally studied the Bible just because they had a deep desire to be smart. And since they were a Christian, well, that's just the natural topic. I'll just study the Bible then, and I can be smart. We don't study the Bible just to be smart. We study the Bible so that we can know God. That's the whole point. Uh, deep reverence for God and His Word. Deep reverence for God and His Word. <laughs> Why is that important? Tough to uh, go into that deep of a study of something that you have no respect for. Absolutely. What else? Let's say you do go into a study and you, and you come across a topic that's really hard to swallow. Not hard to understand, hard to swallow. If you have a deep reverence for the Word of God, what will you do? You let it change you. If you don't have a deep reverence for the Word of God, you're going to kick against the goads, to use a biblical phrase. <laughs> for example... I like the King James on that one. Yeah. Kick against the pricks. There you go. <laughs> for example, why, do the denominational, why does the denominational world... Why, why does the denominational world have such a struggle understanding the clear meaning of baptism? Because they don't want to. It, it destroys their entire theology. It's not just a matter of switching your view on baptism. See, when we talk to the denominational world about baptism, it's not just about baptism. It's their entire scope of the Bible and what they believe. Yeah, right? Um, qualifications for elders. I mean, it's pretty clear. It's, it's really not that difficult to understand. It's just a matter of stomaching. It's a matter of stomaching... We don't have anybody like that, but we still need elders. What do we do? You know, do we want to do the hard work of training men and forcing them to mold themselves to become more holy so they can lead the church? Or do we just want to cop out and go, this guy seems pretty good. He runs a business. Let's just put him in there. You see? It's hard to stomach. But we had deep reverence for the Word of God. When we read that, we say, listen, that's what the Bible says, and we're not going to compromise. And it needs to be a man. That's what it says. Uh, sympathy with divine truth. Generally, our problem is not with grammar and understanding the language. It's a problem of the heart. A sympathy with the divine truth. All right. Educational. And we'll have more discussion, guys. I promise. I just want to kind of power through this so we don't get completely bogged down in the introduction. Educational. No perfect interpreter. There is no such thing as a perfect interpreter no one possesses all the requirements. That's letter A. No one possesses all the requirements. It's just a matter of degree. All right? And we want to go to a higher degree of being educated to interpret the Scriptures. Christianity has always relied on the professional teacher. Who was the first one? Jesus. And what did he do? Knowing that he was going to leave after three years, what did he do? trained people to what? Teach. To teach. That's literally what he did. What, what were the missions that he sent the disciples out on? Go and teach and preach. Here's your sermon. Let me write it for you. Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Come back and let me know how, how it worked. He sent them out on little, you know, on little missions. Um, 
majority of the time, and this is a different topic, majority of the time, if you list out the uh, Gospels, you know, in a chronological order and, and realize the, the different um, feasts that Jesus went to and see his lifespan, Jesus spent most of his time intimately teaching the Twelve, not amongst the masses. We read the story about the masses because that's when he healed people or did a great, you know, one of those big parables or something like really important. But most of his time was spent intimately with the twelve, off by themselves, training them and molding them. Um, language. So in, uh, in education, no one possesses all the requirements. In education, it is good, it, it is helpful to know the Greek and Hebrew, but it's not necessary. It's good and helpful, but it's not necessary. When I was first studying Greek, um, you know, people knew that I was studying Greek. They'd come to me all the time. Wait, what's the word for this? Hey, what does this mean? And half the time, I didn't know because I was like, I just learned this. You know what I mean? I don't really know that much. But after, let's see, 10 years of using Greek and, um, you know, translating multiple books of the Bible and, you know, ser- uh, how many sermons I've exegeted, you know, with Greek and stuff, my conclusion that I've come down to is that, the, the major translations that we have today, you know, the, the NIV, the NASB, um, you know, the, the Net Bible, the ESV, you know, these major translations, it's not like you'll never know. There's some sort of really hidden meaning in the Greek, and you'll never know what it is if you just read English. <laughs> of course, there's always a step removed when you translate from one language to another, you know. You have an idiom in Greek. How do you put that into English? How do you take our idiom, cat got your tongue, and put that into Chinese? You can't do it word for word because they're going to look at you like you're an idiot. (laughs) 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 So, anyways. Y'all laugh and encourage us. It's yours. 10 years, I'm going to keep it. So, so it's, it's, it's good to know the languages, and there is... I would say it's like this. It's not that you won't know the meaning. You might just have a fuller appreciation for a certain meaning if you can know the Greek or the Hebrew, but it's not necessary. We've already talked about the discipline of study. The discipline of study. It is a discipline because studying is more than just read the Bible and, all right, I've read my chapter for the, for the night. I'm going to move on. That's not studying. All right, that's just reading. And then you have the special acquaintance with, here's your three terms, ready, history, my wife's favorite. Not, she hates history. That's how I put her to sleep. I just start telling something about history and she falls asleep on me. Um, Anthropology, A-N-T-H. Got it. Some of us can't spell it. Not the store. A-N-T-H-R-O. P-O-L-O-G-Y, anthropology. Anthropology is the term, anthropos is the Greek term for man, so it's the study of man. You just study different cultures, that's what it means. Studying like kind of like cultures and different traditions, different um, moral values, things like that. Uh, And geography. That is, you'll, you'll be able to understand certain things about the scripture better And not only better, but there are certain things about the Scripture you will never understand unless you know certain things about history, (laughs) anthropology, or geography. For example, I believe that you will never be able to understand the books of 1st or 2nd John unless you understand the historical context. If you don't know anything about proto-Gnosticism, then you will not have any clue what 1st or 2nd John mean. You just won't. Um... Correct. That means that uh, like the that's inceptive Gnosticism. So Gnosticism was never in the first century. It was in the second century. So it was an incipient form of Gnosticism in the first century, based off of Greek dualism. I know. See, yeah. if you don't, if you don't you know about that, about it, that Gnostic stuff yes, bunches yes, of time. Yeah. Yeah. It simply means the the incipient form of it. Yeah. In there. Yeah. It wasn't full blown in the first century. Uh, So they don't call it Gnosticism technically. A lot of people refer to it as Gnosticism because it's pretty much what formed into Gnosticism. Um, And then, um, like, Revelation. Again, if you don't don't know what was going on in the first century, you just won't know what's happening in Revelation. I don't care what, you know, certain TV evangelists say today. It's not about what's happening over in Russia and the Middle East now. Um, 
Christianity is a taught religion. A taught? A taught religion. Yep. It's always been about people teaching others. And it's very rare. How many people have you ever met in your life who came to church and said, you know, I found this Bible on Grandma's shelf after she passed away, and I sat down for the past five years and studied it, and I've come to these conclusions. Jesus is the Son of God. I need to be baptized for the remission of my sins, and I need to join a local church. (laughs) Nobody does that. Nobody does that. People need to be taught. That's the way God intended it, and that's the way it's set up. Well, that's yeah, people. Christ's command. Yes. Go and teach. And teach. Yep. <laughs> mm-hmm. I mean, how much more simple does it need to be? Because we are sinners, we also don't have this innate desire to go, there's a God out there, I must know him. Let me search with him with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength. People just don't do that. So it's a taught religion. All right? This is why evangelism is important because when we evangelize, people have, you find people, you ever heard of low hanging fruit? You know what that term means? Business bingo. Is that what it is? Yeah. You know, you know what the low, term low hanging fruit is? It's the easy thing to get. It's the easy evangelism, right? It's the person who basically is out there in the world, they're in sin, but they go, hey, you know, I know there's a God out there. I really wish I had a relationship with him. But they're just wandering in darkness. That's what the Bible calls them. And you go and you shine a light and go, here it is, here's a path. And they go, oh, great, that's the one I've been looking for. Let me jump on it. You see, I mean, that's low-hanging fruit. There's no debate there. There's no hard arguments. There's no having to convince there is a God or the Bible's the Word of God. They're already there. They just need a little bit of teaching to direct them on the right path. Low-hanging fruit. All right, intellectual um, qualifications, supreme regard for the truth, vivid conception, sound judgment. This is more for um, somebody who's, like, going to be a teacher, a professional teacher or preacher. This is some qualifications that they need to have. It's just important to recognize that that the church is never going to get the job done of winning the world by flashy shows, big programs, lights, cameras, and actions. The church is going to get its job done when people are knowing the Word of God. And people will not, the church will not know the Word of God unless you have leaders who are teaching the Word of God. It's just the way it is. All right? So... There's a sermon that I heard one time, Leaders Must Know the Word of God, and it was really, really convicting talking about leaders must know the Word of God because everything flows from the top down. I mean, that's, that's just organizational. That, that's not even just the church. You know, if you have a bad leadership on a football team, then you're the Washington Redskins. That's just how you're going to be, a loser for your entire life. That's just how we are, man. We have to accept it. That's why we don't go to the playoffs, because we have bad leadership. He's top down because he thinks somebody at the top should go. They should. Yeah. All right. The tools for an interpreter. To, uh, I don't think I list these for you. Most of you guys know these, so we're done the first handout. Woo! Yay! All right. It wasn't seven minutes. Huh? Yeah. No, it wasn't. All right. The tools for an interpreter. We all know them. Different versions, concordances, dictionaries, books on historical background, introductions, commentaries. Here's your goal in hermeneutics. Ready? To not need a commentary. That's that's your goal. Not that you won't use them but that you won't need them. Well, here's what you don't want to be. Let me read Romans 1. I have no idea what this means, and I have no idea to figure out what this means. Here's my commentary on Romans 1. What does he say? That's what I'll believe. You don't want to do that. Here's what you want to do. Here's Romans 1. I don't know what it means. I know the tools on how to figure it out. Let me work through this. All right, now let me go compare that to some commentaries and see what they say, and then critique them. That's what you want to do. The rewards of hermeneutics, it's a personal level. Um, we're able to see the Bible holistically. We're able to have a deeper appreciation for God, who He is. Uh, let's look up three scripture verses real quick. Who wants to go, who wants to, go to um, Acts 8? Pick me, pick me. All right, Acts 8, 30 through 31. Who wants to go to 1 Timothy? 1 Timothy 4, 16. <clears throat> All right. Acts 8, 30 through 31. Go ahead, Mike. Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and said, Do you understand what you are reading? And he said, Well, how could I, unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Why was Philip there? To guide him. No, 
No, why was Philip there at that point on that road walking along? Because God sent him. Because God sent him. What is the Holy Spirit's role in interpretation of the Scriptures? <clears throat> does He divinely illumine your mind so you come to the right interpretation? No. What He does is He finds somebody who says, gosh, I want to understand this, but I can't figure it out. And God says, here's somebody who does. Here's a book who, who has the right teaching. Here's a sermon that's the right interpretation. Let me put this person in the pathway of that. That's what God, that's what the Holy Spirit does. You're reading along and you're going, you know, I just can't figure out this whole doctrine of baptism. I, you know, all these interpretations, I just don't get it. What does he do? You're searching for a church, he might lead you to the right church. You're sitting in a coffee shop and somebody sits down and cracks open their Bible. Oh, you read the Bible too? Yeah. Hey, I got a question for you. And then, here, what do you know? That person can teach you. That's what the Holy Spirit does. Okay, this is what we see in the scriptures. 1 Timothy 4.16 Keep a close watch on how you live and on your teaching. Stay true to what is right for the sake of your own salvation and the salvation of those who hear you. Twofold on why we need to have good hermeneutics. Number one, it helps us. Number two, it helps others. It helps others. Hey, listen. Everybody, everybody pipe up for this one. Evangelism is affected by your ability to interpret. That means somebody's salvation is dependent on your ability to understand the Scriptures. So, if somebody rejects the Word of God because they do not accept the Word of God, that's one thing. If they reject the Word of God because you're bad at explaining it, that's on you. That's on you. And it's, and it's not that, you know, you're a diligent student and you're doing your best and you've been a Christian for six months and somebody asks you what's your view on, you know, dispensational premillennialism. You're, oh. <laughs> you know what I mean? That, no, 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 there's different. You've been, in the, you've been in the church for 15 years and somebody says, hey, can you help me understand what justification means? And you're like, I don't even know what that term means. Just as if I... Yeah. <laughs> Duh. So, Yeah important. We need to recognize that people's salvation is at stake. The Holy Spirit does not zap people for salvation. They come to Christ because they hear the gospel taught. And as we said the first week, it's not only a matter of knowing the true doctrine, but also being able to adequately explain it. That is, in a way that is convincing, in a way that is good, not boring. <laughs> That's important. All right, false principles of interpretation. You guys ready? I want to hit these so we have a, um, an understanding for the return to sound hermeneutics, and also so we have a context to compare good hermeneutics versus bad hermeneutics. And I picked some very uh, hyperbolically bad. Is that even a good phrase for that? Let's say, I picked some really bad interpretations so that we would all be able to just go, ha, that's ridiculous. So you can see, this is why we don't want to practice bad hermeneutics. All right, number one is the allegorical approach. Question, is allegory used in Scripture? Don't be scared. Is allegory used in Scripture? Yeah, right. Allegory is used in Scripture. But what we mean by this approach is, and here's our definition, the introduction of hidden meanings that transcend the literal sense of the text. The definition of hidden meanings that transcend the literal sense of the text where no such interpretation is suggested or justified. And you can underline that last part. Where no such interpretation is suggested or justified. This is what separates good allegorism from false allegorism. I'll give you one. Have you, anybody ever heard of Christian science? Mm -hmm. Mary Baker, Eddie Patterson, whatever you know, husband she was married to at the time. She did. She had like five last names. Um, the founder of Christian science, which as some have put, is neither Christian nor science, um, and it's not. She wrote this in her famous science and health book. For three years after my discovery, that is of this secret 
meaning of Christianity, which had been lost for 18 centuries after Jesus, but now she discovered. Which, by the way, if you ever start there, no. Questions. Yeah. <laughs> if, if a doctrine has been lost for 2,000 years, and now all of a sudden God has given it to us, you must ask yourself, why did God hide it from all those Christians for 2,000 years? But, for three years after my discovery, I sought the solution of this problem of mind healing. See, she's all about healing. Searched the scriptures and read little else, kept aloof from society, and devoted time and energies to discovering a positive rule. The search was sweet, calm, not selfish nor oppressing. I knew the principle of all harmonious mind action to be God, and that cures were produced in primitive Christian healing, and I won my way to absolute conclusions through divine revelation. See, I got divine revelation. Reason and demonstration. The revelation of truth and the understanding came to me gradually, and apparently through divine power. So she's talking about how she had this direct connection to God, and he gave her this knowledge. When a, here it is. When a new spiritual idea is born to earth. So she's saying, look, you know, this is a new idea that hasn't been in Christianity for all these years, except for in primitive Christianity, but it's new now, and I got it. Yeah. When a new spiritual idea is born to earth, the prophetic scripture of Isaiah is renewedly fulfilled, Unto us a child is born, and his name shall be called Wonderful. So what scripture did she quote? Isaiah 7. About, what is it about? The virgin birth, right? She quotes that scripture to say, not that this was about God becoming a literal man. What she says it means is the term Christ uh, is this hidden knowledge. Right, that she now has, this Christian science hidden knowledge. Jesus had it because he had this direct connection to God. Right? But now that she has it, she's the Christ. Oh boy. See, Jesus had that special knowledge, so he got to be the Christ to his generation. But now she has this knowledge, so she gets to be the Christ to her generation. Where is she special? Yeah, because the Bible says, unto us a child is born. And the child being the special, special hidden knowledge. So, this secret meaning that transcends the literal meaning of the text. You see there? I mean, if you just read that, you'd go, what in the world? How'd she make that leap? I know. That, that's the point. That's what, that's what my brain is trying to figure out. <laughs> and remember, I said I'm picking, it, I'm picking <laughs> really extravagant ones, so that way we can see how crazy they are. Um, a subset of this... Uh, okay, is the mystical and spiritual methods. That's number three under allegory. The mystical and spiritual methods of interpretation grow out of allegorism. I'll put here that topical preachers and liberals... It's mystical, mystical and, and spiritual. I'll put here that topical preachers and liberals camp out here. This is their method of interpretation. Now, topical sermons are not all bad. And I'm not against topical sermons. They have their place. There's a lot of um, safeguards you got to put in when you do a topical sermon. you got to do it appropriately. We're not going to talk about this here. But what I would say is this. Be very, not skeptical, cautious when listening to a topical sermon. Um, Can you clarify just... So a topical if, if sermon was to say I'm going to do a 10 week series on love. Well, let's just let's just take one sermon. Let's just say, "Hey, I want to do a sermon on love." And so during the sermon, I'm going to throw out to you 15 scriptures. We're not necessarily going to take the time to read them all, and the most important part is we're not going to take the time to look at the context of all of them. Mm-hmm. What we're going to do is go, you know, Jesus loves, you know, sinners, as it says in and you might quote the scripture. You know, and Jesus loves even people who have committed adultery in John 8, you know, and blah, blah, blah. Okay, and your statements might be true, but they might not. <coughs> Why? Well, because it's really easy to say, well, you know, this is a teaching and then quote a scripture. But you've got to get back to the original meaning of that scripture to know that it actually applies to the whatever you're saying it applies to, because it might not. As I showed you a really crazy example right here, but to somebody who does let's say somebody who's never read the Bible, and they pick up Mary Baker Eddy, and they have no critical analysis in their brain, and they, they say, oh, well, the Bible says, unto us a child's born, and that child is this esoteric knowledge that she now has. She's the Christ. Let me follow her. 
You see, and we go, oh, that's crazy. That's crazy. Who would have believed that? But how many, how many times do people do that with other things? See? Like, for example, I, I give, you know, I know this is a touch, touchy subject, subject, but it's the first thing to come to my mind, and I don't want to get off into a debate about it, so please don't. But, um, you know, I had, I had a girl one time who said, uh, you know, she, she heard me teach on, you know, women's roles in the church, and she goes, well, Galatians says there's neither male nor female. There's neither slave nor free. Everybody's equal. That means you can, everybody can do the same exact thing. And I'm like, well, if you get back to the original context of that, it has nothing to do about function in the church. It has everything to do about value in Christ. But see, it's easy just to quote a scripture and move on and not get back to the original context and what it means and whether it applies to whatever you're talking about. Okay? So, topical sermons, you got to be careful with them because you could throw out a lot of scriptures and people can just go, well, I mean, there's a scripture on the board. It's got to be true. Um, let's see here. Do we have time for this? What was that? I have two minutes. Hey, do you guys want to, um, do y'all want to power through these next three so that way next week we can start on the, the meat and potato stuff or do y'all want to kind of go into some more detail I'll about... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, oh, here we go. Yes, it is. Everyone does. It's not I can't copy all the anybody. I know. Yeah. I mean, we did the same thing. Killing all of us. Is it a need? Nobody got it. Yeah. See, Darlene got it. The need. I don't know what the second. one It underscores the need for a return to sound methods. Well, I think she went out, but I didn't write it down. All right, and it gives us context of comparison between good interpretation and bad interpretation. I told y'all from the very beginning that I skipped stuff. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> Don't give us a handout. Some of us can't handle blanks. <laughs> Just let the handouts pass Carrie next time. Then. <laughs> she can copy it all down herself. <laughs> um, do you guys want to? Do y'all want to talk about B, C, and D in, in a little bit of detail, or do y'all just want to breeze through it and be done with the introduction? Just, just roll on. Power through it. All right, let's power through it. Okay. The um, we won't. I'll give you. Won't give you another example of the mystical approach. Then, all right. The rational, rationalistic approach, and approaching the scriptures, assuming they are purely of human origin. You'll find this a lot in uh, liberals, you know, even uh, liberals who call themselves Christians and, and atheists today, not believing that the word is inspired or that there's any connection between Moses and Paul or Jesus. That they're all you know individuals. Who just uh, you know teach our individual thoughts, so they don't see any connection in the scriptures. Apologetic. This is not in the good sense of defending Christianity, but it is using the scriptures to rationalize and justify a theological concept or religious idea. Using the scripture to rationalize and justify a theological concept or religious idea which originated independent of the exegetical process. This is called proof texting. That is, you know what? I believe. That, you know, whatever. This, this is what I hold strong to. Let me go over to the Bible, you know, find out where it says that I'm right. We talked about that the first week, right? It's called eisegesis. That's proof texting. And you can, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. So the apologetic, that, that is, you're defending your position. You teach your grand ideas... Right? And this is why I said topical sermons you got to be cautious of, because a lot of times a preacher could, could do this, not even meaning to. He can go, man, I just feel really strongly about this. We should not have a coffee bar in the church. You know, all these people mingling, right? they need to come here, they need to do this, they need to do that. Right? Let me go where the Bible says, you know, re- revere God. You don't revere God when you're sitting there mingling, drinking coffee. You know, they'll just bust out all these texts. Where you, get, you get all on your hobby horse about something? Right? Does the Bible actually say that? Maybe not. That's why you got to be uh, very careful with topical sermons. All right, the super literal, super literal to impose an arbitrary, to impose an arbitrary, selective, and modern literalism on the text without consideration of literary or theological theological context. All right, real quick, look, y'all need to understand this. We un we read the scriptures through a 21st century Gentile mind. The Bible was written to men and women of the ancient Near East. There's a great amount of context lost. So please understand that when we come to the Scriptures, we are reading it far removed from its original audience. 
And I will hit on this one next week before we get into the axioms because it is extremely important.